Good day, Bermuda. I'm Jamila Lodge of the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation, and this is Mind Your Business, the show that brings you the latest information about starting and running a local business in Bermuda. Join us as we discuss the local business issues that are important to you. Today in the studio, I have with me Mr. Buzzy Thibodeau. He is the Executive Vice President of Junior Achievement, and he is visiting us all the way from... From New Orleans. New Orleans, excellent. Well, welcome to Bermuda. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. So you're here because Global Entrepreneurship Week, which is this worldwide event, is happening, and we've invited you along with another uh, international guest to Bermuda to talk a little bit or inspire our entrepreneurs, if you will. But before we get into the questions, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I think the most thing that's relevant for your audience is that I've worked for our organization for about 36 years. Okay. Um, and I think I'm one of the lucky people whose uh, passion has collided with their profession. Okay. And so for 36 years in multiple jobs, I've worked for our organization uh, trying to prepare and inspire young people to be successful in a global economy. That's awesome. So what exactly is Junior Achievement? So we're an NGO, a not-for-profit organization that's large, global in scope. In fact, we're the oldest and largest global economic education organization in the world. Okay. Um, what we do is, as I mentioned, we prepare and inspire young people to be successful in a global economy. Okay. And typically we do that in three particular areas, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm financial liter literacy, and work readiness. We reach about 10 million students, K through 12, kindergarten through 12, around the world. About 5 million of those are in the United States. Okay. So in terms of a curriculum, and you have a standardized curriculum that gets implemented into the school systems, is that how it works? We do have a standardized curriculum. Uh, usually each region around the world uses their own curriculum so they can match it to the needs of their particular communities okay. and countries and regions. Um, but what's, what's common, I think, through all is our sort of our philosophy about what we do. And what we're always trying to do is create relevant and authentic connections to the business community. Right. Um, inspiring and preparing is important. We typically use the word inspiring before the word preparing because we think that's such a critical part for young people to be inspired and motivated to go to the next level. Right. And so the curriculum inspires. How do you... Or, in your experience, because 30 something years, that's a long time. It's a long time. It's a long time. <laughs> so I'm sure you got to see a lot of different ways in which this curriculum has been implemented throughout the states and probably other jurisdictions as well. But what has been your experience in terms of how students receive the curriculum? Are they all excited about it? Or is, are some, is it in some cases where um, it doesn't have the desired effect that, that you want? So our model is a little bit different. We've been around for 98 years. I haven't been, but our program has been around for 98 years. Right. And our model is a little bit different than a lot of what I would call pure curriculum. Okay. And the reason being is because we engage volunteers. So in the United States alone, we use 250,000 volunteers that go into the classroom every year to help with the inspiration part. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what makes unique, our programs unique and more engaging. Mm -hmm. So when a student goes through the programs and has their life changed and reflects back upon it, right. rarely do they talk about the content. Okay. Typically they talk about a caring individual, someone who saw something in me that maybe their teacher didn't see, someone who uh, excites them about their future, someone who they can relate to. Right. So whether it's in, when we're dealing with you know, female entrepreneurship mm -hmm. or in underserved communities, Finding those role models that go in the classroom and excite the students is really what works the best for us. Okay, that makes sense. So you mentioned that you the um, it starts from K through 12. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel like you have the most impact? Like what age should a child be introduced to entrepreneurship, you would say? Well, I think... A lot of times, high school and middle school is where people are making career decisions, so we see more around that, but we also believe in a continuum of experiences. Right. So we think even at a younger age, when I was in elementary school, kindergarten, first grade, I didn't have access to the information right. that students have now. They're so much further advanced. Mm -hmm. So we feel starting at a younger age is important to sort of build a foundation so by the time they reach middle and high school where they start to make serious decisions about their future, mm -hmm. they actually have a better foundation that they can build upon. I would agree with you 100%. I mean, I definitely think that, I mean, my job is to promote entrepreneurship, right? right? <laughs> That's right. what I do. But I do think that 
economies are better for it having that mix, right? You have regular organizations, which are started by entrepreneurs, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, but you also want to have that nice mix um, to create variety and a sustainable economy, I think. And so definitely um, exposing young people to entrepreneurship earlier, I think, can create... Um, give them the option, right? right? They don't have to, you know, go down and be an accountant necessarily. They can create jobs for other people. So, so I would agree with you there. Now, when you identify maybe a student that has this, they're just on it, they're switched on, how do you think it best to nurture that type of talent? So nurturing is, is uh, this is, a I would think, from a curriculum point of view, an education point of view, yeah. uh, somewhat of a new science. Uh, Universities in the United States really didn't have entrepreneurship programs probably 10 or 15 years ago. So I think we're learning as we go. Right. But I do think when I talk to people who have become entrepreneurs, I think providing them with ex multiple experiences and letting them engage as they see best. Yeah. Um, I had a young lady I spoke to who was on the TV show Shark Tank. Yeah. And she told me when she went to college, she took a course in entrepreneurship and she dropped the course like eight straight times because she felt, in her words, it was corporate America trying to teach me entrepreneurship. Yeah. She said, but then again, I started engaging in different types of experiences right. in the way I wanted to. Okay. And that's, she said, so that really nurtured her long. I do think there is some model in education where we, in junior achievement, start with sort of the exposure, the discovery part, just right. exposing students to different experiences. And then we go into the prepare part. Okay. That's where we develop knowledge, sort of the knowledge development, advancement, and skill development. And then I think at some point, these really high-level people that are really all in on entrepreneurship, you've got to create a framework where they can engage at a higher level, mm -hmm. where they can activate what they've learned right. in a way that's very realistic. It's interesting because, you know, I'm in a situation where I'm helping to educate and teach people about entrepreneurship. And you're like, can entrepreneurship be taught? Like some people say you're born an entrepreneur. What do you think? I mean, can you? Well, I think I mean, that's been debated quite a bit. <laughs> the, the, the born of bread, the right. nurture, a, a natural. Um, I think people are born with talents. Everyone's got talents. And I think there are some talents that lend themselves to being an entrepreneur. Okay. You know, things like managing risk and sales. That does not mean a person who doesn't have significant amount of those talents can't be an entrepreneur. Okay. But I do think there are some talents, but if those talents aren't developed, mm -hmm. they're not going to be a very successful entrepreneur anyway. Right. But there's been a lot of studies on some successful entrepreneurs about what are the things that are in common with these people. And you're starting to see some patterns develop. Um, communication skills are right. so, so important. How do you navigate, negotiate, influence, those kind of things. I think those are all very, very important. Um, the number one is risk management, though. That's based on research, risk management. So if they, people can learn how to manage that moving forward, and a lot of times it's knowledge about things like financial matters. Right. I mean, that, that helps with risk management. Yeah, and I think those parts can be learned, right? But mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, from my experience, having conversations with people who are willing to take those risks, right? Because with entrepreneurship, you are in charge of your own destiny. You're not getting that paycheck unless you work for That's it, right? Correct. That is correct. I mean, one, one analogy we use in the United States a lot has to do with the focus on athletes. Okay. We identify athletes in the United States at a very young age and start nurturing them because yeah. sports are so important to our society in right. the United States. And, I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about why aren't we doing the same thing when we see people with certain skill yeah. sets and really, and especially the ones who are really interested in nurturing them, the young ladies and young men who have the interest. We think there could be some real opportunities to develop some very interesting pathways in communities. I would agree with you 100%. And you know what's exciting to me, though, is that I think we are moving towards that, where we are saying, okay, let's create and put in place, like, um, curriculums and programs mm -hmm. like Junior Achievement so that when you identify that person at least there is a pathway that they can sort of follow right to be nurtured in mm -hmm. that space so um, I think you're you're absolutely right about that now you, you spoke a bit or I've read an article that you wrote and you talk about leaders being entrepreneurial minded what is that exactly so I think when you think about um, being entrepreneurial, it's about creatively solving a problem or adding value. Okay. And I think frequently, 
we all talk about starting a business, which is really important because we think entrepreneurs can be the rocket fuel for an economy, yes. really fuel an economic engine. And so I'm, I think that's really, really important. But I think what you are seeing is when people have certain knowledge, certain skills, and a certain attitude, which are things in our organization, that's how we measure efficacy, mm -hmm. the effect of our programs. Mm -hmm. I think those can be applied in, a, in multiple contexts. Right. And I think you're seeing more and more large employers in the United States talk about hiring people with entrepreneurial mindsets so they can operate in their department with their people as an entrepreneur might, creatively solving problems, yep. adding value, doing those kind of things, the same thing an entrepreneur would do in a startup enterprise. Yep. I mean, it makes sense. You want somebody to be able to think outside of the box, right? Mm -hmm. And most entrepreneurs live outside of the box. Most so. Most <laughs> most so, but we're better for it, I can assure you that. So what would be your tips or your suggestions for Bermuda as we look towards fostering and nurturing entrepreneurial mindedness um, for the country, for our young people, for existing entrepreneurs, et cetera? Well, first, the fact that you recognize the importance is a big step. Because a lot of pe places we go to and we hear and we talk to, I don't think it's really, it's still a little bit outside on the fringes. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's as mainstream right. as you would probably think it might be. But for the communities and the countries and the territories and the regions that are accepting it, my suggestion would be, first off, I think you've got to be um, very systematic in your approach. Okay. Most places have assets, but rarely do you see the assets in any alignment whatsoever. And whether it be turf problems or political problems or whatever, but I think being systematic helps you make systemic change. Okay. So that's the first suggestion I would have. The second thing, I think you've got to be very intentional. Don't just hope it happens. Right. You've got to have a vision. Like at the end of the success, how are we going to define success and then work backwards? I right. mean, there's a saying in strategic planning that the, the, stru the structure should follow the strategy. Mm -hmm. So once you start with the outcomes and you have the strategy, then you build the structure. So start at the end rather than the beginning, okay. but get started. Yeah. And finally, be yourself. You have assets here. Don't try to be Silicon Valley. Yeah. Be yourself and, and try to understand what do we have to offer and try to figure that out and then use and leverage those assets. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm taking notes. I might have okay. to look back at this to, to get it, but um, thank you for that. And I, I feel like we're trying and we're working on doing some of those things, but certainly sometimes hearing it from someone else makes it all that better. <laughs> But no, I really do appreciate you taking the time out to come here to Bermuda to um, so we can pick your brain a little bit and hopefully we'll be able to implement some of, the, of your suggestions. Well, global entrepreneurship as we work is really important because it celebrates entrepreneurship and I think it brings it more in the mainstream. Okay. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming, Bucky. We'll be right back. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with Mind Your Business. How do you get inspired? Join BEDC on Mind Your Business to find out how entrepreneurs get inspired to start up their businesses rather online or brick and mortar. Be part of the startup movement that can help you to start up the next great business idea. Tune in weekly to Mind Your Business because if you don't, who will? Welcome back to Mind Your Business. I'm your host, Jamila Lodge, and joining me now in the studio is our another international guest, Monica Doty, who is the Managing Director of the Women's Venture Capital Fund. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So is this your first time to Bermuda? Well, it's been a long time, maybe 30 years. Okay, uh, <laughs> you're coming the first time. You're coming back again. Okay, before we get into the questions, we're talking a little bit about entrepreneurship and Global Entrepreneurship Week, which we're celebrating along with the rest of the world. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. So currently, I'm Managing Director of the Women's Venture Capital Fund, mm -hmm. uh, which we formed to invest in women entrepreneurs. But for most of my career, 30 years, I've been an entrepreneur myself. Okay. So I've been involved in four different startups, MTV, AOL. So it's been a lovely, crazy ride. I'm sure. <laughs> that, I mean, it sounds really exciting just looking at your bio and your CV. I'm like, she did all that? Hi. <laughs> Um, so with organizations like you work for Disney, you co-founded MTV Europe, um, how does 
working for larger organizations differ from running your own business or being an entrepreneur? I would say the main difference is capital. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, that's probably the biggest pain point for any entrepreneur is having the capital with which to start your business. Um, and while uh, many of the projects I was involved with at MTV and mm -hmm. at Disney and AOL were entrepreneurial, we were starting new businesses, okay. we already had access to capital with right. which to you know, devote the resources necessary to scale and build the business. I'm sure that makes it a lot easy, mm -hmm. right? I know in my organization, we see people coming all the time. They need that capital. So being able to have it, I'm sure, makes things a lot easier. Have you ever been in a situation where just you working on your project alone, you did not have access to that capital? And oh, if, yeah. If that was the case, how did you navigate that? Well, uh, probably the one that's most appropriate is a company I started after Disney when I saw that a lot of the Disney licensees, companies that created products with, you know, The Lion King or Little Mermaid, um, school lunch boxes, what have you, were being quite successful in the marketplace. I said, well, I'm going to start my own company. So I created a, a recycled paper products company in okay. Europe. Um, greeting cards, wrapping paper um, with Disney characters and sold into all the major retailers. Okay. But, um, you know, just get trying to get the money going yeah. with which to, so a lot of it was get trade payables, a lot of strategic partnerships. Okay. Um, uh, back then we also had commercial banks that were very supportive. So with the Disney license, it just enabled me to have a lot more credibility. I would think. But yeah. I have to say, I've been at times where I was I had to use my American Express card to make payroll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's what you have to do, right? Mm -hmm. in, in hopes or, um, or faith that you're gonna be able to, to pay that debt off. Mm -hmm. Um, so we talked with Buzzy Thibodeau before, and we talked a little bit about entrepreneurial mindfulness. So you working with Disney, like you said, within these larger organizations, you were entrepreneurs creating these companies, you know, um, establishing these, these new products or brands. What exactly, well, do you feel that you as an entrepreneur, being entrepreneurial minded, um, was necessary in order for you to be successful in those roles? Well, I think a lot of it was being able to um, appreciate the skills of the folks that we were bringing on board because okay. um, it was a wide open green field and we were you know, laying the seeds as we went along. So for example, with AOL, nobody really knew how popular the internet was. When we were starting Entertainment Asylum, for example, which was an entertainment website, the modems were 33.3, remember yes. those days? Yes. So, so working within the technical constraints as well as human constraints and trying to figure out you know, what does the customer want yeah. um, was, uh, was quite challenging but especially within a large organization that already has the structure, the right. systems, the sort of even the brand identity and the marketing messaging. So all of that had already been worked out within a large organization. So trying to bridge that gap with something new within an old organization, I say old, but an established, I should right. say, organization was, was quite challenging in terms of bringing all those resources together and making people appreciate that you know, there was an opportunity to um, create something huge. And yeah. we now see with the internet, everybody, well, now people have it on their telephones. I know, where... what will we do about <laughs> it at this point? <laughs> <laughs> so now you're working with women, the Women's Venture Capital Fund. So you specifically fund women entrepreneurs, correct? Yeah, well, I would say, I w I'm gonna qualify that, okay. yes. Um, but we do believe in gender diversity. We believe okay. in diversity, period, because when you have different points of view, it just makes for a stronger, better yeah. organization. Okay. And um, we decided to form the Women's Venture Capital Fund because less than 4%, 4% of venture capital goes to teams mm. that have one woman. We're not even talking about CEO, team. Right, well, right. a whole woman team. Right. So therein lied the opportunity mm -hmm. to say, okay, well, there must be some incredibly high potential women. And especially since 80% of the products and services that are bought in the world are bought by women. Yeah. So we are key decision makers for you know, all sorts of different products and services. We, we decided, okay, let's, let's focus on this. But we also said that based on research that diversity makes for higher profitability, 
higher return on investment, higher productivity. So it was a good intersection in terms of supporting women, but also supporting diversity. Okay. So in terms of a typical business that you would support, when you talk about diversity, it means at least one person on the team, on the lead team, has to be a woman. That's right? correct. That's, okay. That has some founding stock, has some skin in the game, so to speak. Right. So can you share how many different organizations or startups you supported and if um, one of the success stories, if you wouldn't mind sharing? Sure, I'd be delighted to. I mean, I'm a great proponent of uh, supporting women. We do have to make a living and uh, <laughs> yes, <we do. laughs> entrepreneurship is a great way to, um, as a career. Yeah. So, you know, I have to say we were getting, or we still get, um, at least 100 business plans a week and we're a small fund. Wow. You know, so there's no lack of deal flow, as mm -hmm. they say in the business, and, and some incredible deals that are just, you know, not even tech, technology driven. And right. we're focused more on um, digital media yeah, because that's what ask. I know. Yeah. Um, but we get, you know, things from biomedical mm -hmm. and uh, clean tech is very hot, but also lifestyle businesses. And so I wish we had a lot more capital, but things are starting to pick up. Okay. There's a lot of other funds, thank God that are forming to support women and, and diversity minorities um, f to make money. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just to, you know, to uh, as, far as a nonprofit goal, right. to be benevolent, but really seeking opportunities that can bring returns to, to your investors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we invested so far in eight companies okay. and um, one we've already had an exit. Okay. The, where we sold to Bed Bath & Beyond, which is a big really? retailer a in the big United deal. States. Yeah. yeah, it's a company called Decorous, and so it was a new way to kind of um, go the next level in interior design. So, you know, at any given moment, 50% of women are redecorating a room, whether a kid's going to college or having a baby mm -hmm. or moving house. And um, she's busy, most women work, most women, you know, have to take care of the family. So this is a service that we provide online linking de uh, de interior designers with, with people, okay. and then they can order the furniture at a discount online for free shipping. Okay. And so that was for Bed Bath & Beyond, which you know needs to go to the next level, mm -hmm. next generation mm -hmm. um, online, that it was a perfect fit for them to, uh, to acquire Decorist. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So um, in Bermuda, a lot of the businesses that we um, support or see are lifestyle businesses, but we do and are starting to see more tech businesses. But I know one thing that I hear a lot when it comes to like investors and um, getting the return on investment is the scalability. And so for that reason, I'm thinking that most businesses that are in the technology space probably are easier to scale. Is that your experience? Yeah, I mean, I would say that's part of it because, okay. um, you know, my major was international economics. Right. So with uh, technical or digital media, the marginal cost is very low. Right. So once you make a movie or once you, for that's a good example, you mm -hmm. make a movie. So every additional ticket that's sold to that movie is the cost is zero. Right. So you can scale really rapidly. So you, we've seen that with Google, mm -hmm. we've seen that with Facebook. And so that's very attractive, but at the same time, people have got to have to want it. Right. You know, and that's, that's the true, key. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we can scale it, but nobody wants it. Right. <laughs> and there have been a lot that bit the dust because right. of that, right? right. So, so it's really determining who your customer is um, before anything else. You have to address a need, what the pain point is. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can do very well and scale very quickly, even if you have to build inventory or develop a supply chain, and it maybe is a little bit more complicated than digital media, right. um, you can scale pretty quickly. We, we saw that with H&M, with yeah. Zara, with yeah, you know a true. lot of lifestyle products that, uh, my company, for example, in the greeting card business, I sold out to American Greetings mm -hmm. after two years because they wanted a foothold in Europe. So I, I got a really decent return on my investment. Right. But that took a lot of work to get it going. It right. was, you know. I think that um, when, when we think about these things and when we try to encourage, you know, people to consider entrepreneurship, it could seem almost like a fantasy or something. It's like, oh, now everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. But there's a lot of work 
like you said, into making or, or identifying that opportunity, then implementing it very well. And for you to be able to create that, identify it, and then sell it to American Greeting, you know, that's a big deal, right? Do you think, and I know we're going to have to wrap up, but do you think that entrepreneurs should start businesses with an exit in mind? Uh, yes, okay. if you want outside capital. Okay. So, because investors want a return on their investment, and there's only two ways that they can get it. It's either they sell the company or they go public in the market, if right. you want investment money. Right. Of course, if your family and friends and other people are investing and they want to grow the business and hold on to it over generations, that's fine. But I'm talking more institutional okay. investors. They're going to want some kind of exit. Right. That's for sure. But, you know, my parents were entrepreneurs. My mom was a hairdresser, my dad was a chef, and they did very well for themselves. Yes, <laughs> and they right. didn't need outside capital right. and they stayed with the business for a long time. So I think there's diff many different shades of entrepreneurism. Right. Um, and it, you know, it's really identifying who your customer is. That's the key. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, we're going to be spending a lot more time together over this week. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely want to thank you. Welcome back to Bermuda. And we look forward to spending more time with you. Me too. Thank you very much for having You're me. You're welcome. All right, thank you for joining us today on Mind Your Business. If you have questions, you can contact the BEDC at 292-5570, or you can email us at info at BEDC.BM. And remember, if you don't mind your business, who will? I'm Jamila Lodge, and thanks for joining us.